Item Number SCP-216 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-216 currently resides in Laboratory 5. Access requires Level 2 clearance. Insertion of recording devices into SCP-216 is prohibited without O5 approval. Description SCP-216 is a 35.6 centimeter or 14 inch high iron safe with a multiple dial combination lock. The lock has seven dials each with numbers ranging from 0 to 9. The combination cannot be changed while the door is open. The weight of the device appears to fluctuate in an obtuse manner. The door of SCP-216 can always be opened, but the accessible interior space appears to change depending on the currently entered combination. Objects placed inside SCP-216 may be accessed by re-entering the combination that was configured when the object was inserted. Objects retrieved from SCP-216 appear to be undamaged by the device. It is speculated that every possible lock combination results in a different interior and that there are approximately 4 million available compartments. It is unknown how many objects currently reside inside SCP-216. An engraving found on the bottom of the safe reads three quarters. It has been hypothesized that the compartments of SCP-216 are shared with three other devices of a similar nature. This hypothesis is consistent with the findings reported in Document 88-B. Document Number 88-A Initial Test Log Combination lock set to 6692724 and door opened. Compartment appears empty. One notebook and pencil placed inside and door closed. Combination lock set to 6692725 and door opened. Compartment appears empty. Combination lock reset to 6692724 and door opened. Notebook and pencil retrieved from compartment. Note, SCP-216 appears to be a very efficient storage solution. Dr. Document number 88B, Test Log 1. Testing the effect of inserted items on the SCP's total mass. Total mass of unit before inserting item, 935.877 kilograms. Notebook and pencil, Total mass, 350 grams. Inserted into SCP-216 and door closed. Total mass of unit after inserting item, 935.965 kilograms. Expected mass, 936.227 kilograms. Actual mass, 935.965 kilograms. Difference, 262 grams. Testing shows that SCP-216 takes on approximately 25% of the mass of its contents, suggesting the mass is distributed evenly between SCP-216 and the three other hypothesized devices. Document number 122-A, Test Log 2. Compartments 0000000 to 0000206 checked for contents. Compartment 0000000 found to contain traces of sawdust. Compartment 0000001 through 0000206 found to be empty. Further testing arranged. Document number 152-D, test log 3. Compartments 00332 through 00398. Each compartment had a body part from a 28-year-old female who had been reported missing on data expunged. Contents removed for identification and then incinerated. Liver, spleen, and lungs not recovered. Document number 159-B, Test Log 4. Compartment 00409, a live wolverine, Gulo Gulo, adult male, with a mass of 30 kilograms. Upon the door being opened, it attacked and killed Dr. They mutilated two nearby D-Class personnel before being shot five times by guards. Autopsy of the Wolverine revealed no anomalies. Subsequent examination of compartment 0000409 has revealed it now contains only loose Wolverine hair with residual traces of Wolverine urine and Wolverine anal musk. 
Document number 160-A, Test Log 5. Compartment 000456. A fully loaded Glock 19 handgun with a round in the chamber and one regular flavor Klondike Bar ice cream dessert. The ice cream bar was not melted, cold to the touch, and remained so as long as it was in the compartment. It was removed for inspection and began to melt within two minutes. It was placed back in the compartment. The door closed for three hours and then reopened. The ice cream bar was in the same slightly melted state as when it was placed back three hours prior. The ice cream bar was removed, placed in a freezer in the nearby second floor cafeteria for one hour. After one hour, it was placed back into the compartment with the handgun, and the door closed. Document number 161-A, Test Log 6. Chamber 000501, confirmed to be empty, had one standard foundation GPS unit placed inside it. When the chamber was sealed, GPS failed. Data from the unit upon retrieval showed that the satellite was unable to confirm source location during this time. Document number 174-B, Test Log 7, Chamber 6162384, 51 apple seeds, Chamber 1846563, 22 apple seeds, Chamber 2960104, 9 apple seeds, Chamber 8585821, 78 apple seeds. Chamber 1111111. One heavily decomposed apple. Document number 152-E. Test log 8. On 0416. All previously checked compartments were opened with the intention of confirming contents. When compartments 000332 and 000398 were opened, individual body parts were found corresponding to an unknown male arranged in the same order as found in Experiment 152-D, including the liver, spleen, and lungs. All previous traces of tissue from Experiment 152-D, which had not been cleaned, were found to have been sterilized from these compartments. Pursuant to request for O5 Directive, body parts were placed back into their compartments. Containment procedures currently under review. Document number 162-A. Test Log 9. Testing performed by Dr. One digital video camera recorder was set to record and placed in compartment 5500000, oriented so as to face outward towards the door. The door was closed, and compartment 5500001 was opened. Compartment 5500001 was found to be empty. The door was closed. Compartment 5500000 was opened again and the video camera recorder was retrieved. Upon viewing the recorded footage, Dr. <laughs> suffered from a transient ischemic attack. The recorded footage shows said doctor placing the video camera inside the safe and closing the door. No time passes before the door is reopened and the video camera is retrieved from the safe. This is inconsistent with the scene reported by Dr. <laughs> no audible sound is present on the recorded footage. A subsequent analysis of the video camera revealed that several internal components of the camera had been fractured. Document number 162-B, test log 10, data expunged, data expunged. Document number 162-D, test log 11. One tape recorder was placed inside compartment 5500000 and the door was closed. Several other compartments were opened and closed before returning to compartment 5500000 and retrieving the tape recorder. The following file has been reported to cause disorientation, nausea, sweating, and a sense of overwhelming despair, abdominal pains, panic attacks, migraines, and strokes. This file should only be listened to in a secure environment. Do not drive or operate heavy machinery for up to 24 hours after listening to this file. Refrain from making quick eye movements while listening to this file.
Item number SCP-221 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-221 is to be kept in a locked container where it cannot be removed, except for further testing by Security Clearance Level 2 personnel. The container is a 15.25 cm by 15.25 cm steel box with a cushioned interior and with an internal locking system. The container is to be placed in a locked room with a guard to ensure that SCP-221 is not taken. Description SCP-221 is a pair of tweezers made out of gold, made in the 16th or 17th century. After subject testing, it was noted that the damaged areas which had been used to gather material samples were smaller than they had been prior to the test. It is currently theorized that SCP-221 uses the minute amounts of gold in the human body to regenerate damage to itself. Subject testing revealed that SCP-221 creates a highly focused case of obsessive-compulsive disorder in any person which uses it on their own body. Subjects will utilize SCP-221 to slowly remove any and all hair from their body before removing finger and toenails, as well as teeth, culminating with the removal of organs, both the external, such as the eyes and skin, and the internal, such as the liver and pancreas using their hands if SCP-221 is not effective enough, though SCP-221 will never be set aside during this process and remains gripped in one of the subject's hands. If SCP-221 is taken away from the subject, they become violent and manic and will use their hands to continue the process, albeit in a less careful manner. It is to be noted that the progression of this behavior is different for each subject, but no less fatal. SCP-221 came into Foundation possession after reports of a human being who was data expunged. Foundation personnel retrieved SCP-221 within 10 hours of the original report. Addendum Test Log 221-1 The test subject, a Class D, was ordered to use SCP-221 to remove his eyebrow hair. While the subject was initially unenthusiastic about this task, after the first 10 minutes, he began to more actively pluck out his own eyebrow hair, and after completely denuding his brow, moved on to plucking out his eyelashes, despite repeated assertions that the test was over. When released after SCP-221 was taken out of the room, he began to pluck out his eyelashes with his own fingers, completely removing all of them before moving on to his toenails. The subject completely removed his toe and fingernails, before yelling and smashing his own face against a wall. The reason for this outburst became apparent when he reached into his mouth and began ripping out his now loosened teeth. Eventually, the subject died from blood loss and shock, halfway through the task of pulling out his own internal organs. Test Log 221-2 The test subjects were two Class D personnel. Test Subject 1, ordered to use SCP-221 on the other Class D. Test Subject 2, after 15 minutes, the test subjects began to argue about how the holder of SCP-221 was using it on the other. The test subjects began to fight for use of SCP-221. Test Subject 1 used SCP-221 to stab Test Subject 2 through the eye, piercing into the brain, immediately killing him. Test Subject 1 then began to use SCP-221 to remove his own eyelashes, continuing then to his teeth and eyes. Test Subject 1 died of blood loss after removing 73% of the skin on his body. Item Number SCP-225 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-2251 is contained at Site-65 for study and experimentation. No guards are necessary for the object itself, as theft is impossible and the object is harmless for the moment. Ongoing tests are to be made to find a way to eliminate SCP-2251, or at least to find a way to move it from its position in a controllable fashion. SCP-2252 is as yet uncontainable and should be monitored as best as possible as it travels, with constant updates as to its current position, speed, and trajectory, along with projections as to its estimated position for the next 50 years. As of this writing, SCP-225 poses no immediate threat. However, 
in the event that a collision course with SCP-2251 is detected. SCP-225 is to be immediately upgraded to Keter, and every effort must be made to find a way to alter SCP-2251 or SCP-2252 from their courses. All Foundation resources are to be made available for this objective, should a collision ever become probable. Planetary evacuation plans are to be drawn up as a precaution, as are revised containment procedures for Keter-level items whose containment being compromised by data expunged would not also result in the item's imminent destruction. Description SCP-2251 and SCP-2252 are shiny gray metallic spheres of unknown origin and composition, each with a diameter of 0.681 meters. SCP-2251 appears stable and motionless, but is in fact moving in a geosynchronous path above Earth, at the exact speed of Earth's rotation, maintaining its relative position at all times. Gravity, magnetism, and all other forces tested have had no effect upon it. It maintains position approximately 7.3 meters above the surface. No amount of force brought to bear on it in any direction has any effect upon its position. All tools and weaponry tested have no effect upon it physically. SCP-2252 follows a path around the Sun that is nearly synchronous with Earth's. It does not orbit Earth. Earth rotates under it, giving it the illusory appearance of traveling around the Earth at velocities usually ranging from 1600 to 2000 km per hour, depending on its current relative altitude. It does not technically orbit the Sun either. It appears to be moving under its own power via unknown means. Its course has not been entirely predictable. Differences between SCP-2252's path and Earth's orbit move the planet closer to or further away from SCP-2252, within a surprisingly small level of variance to date. Since it was first observed in it has never reached a relative altitude of less than 10 kilometers, generally staying between kilometers and kilometers above the surface, though it has moved as far away as data expunged, resulting in a temporary loss of contact, contact re-established after the lunar impact incident. Similarly to SCP-2251, no force or weaponry brought to bear upon it has had any effect, though testing on it is significantly more difficult, time-consuming, and resource-intensive due to the variation in its relative position. Addendum to summarize, no effort to move or damage SCP-2251 has any effect, and no effort to stop or damage SCP-2252 has any effect. SCP-2252 destructively travels through any object in its path, without pause and or it pushes it out of the way, regardless of that object's composition. SCP-2251 is unaffected by any amount of force brought to bear on it in any direction. While individually each object is not as yet of any major concern, there are cataclysmic implications should the two objects collide. Projections based upon the estimated amount of material contained between the two objects, 0.33 cubic meters, or approximately 2,600 kilograms, show that should the objects annihilate each other, they would release at minimum the power of a gigaton nuclear explosion potentially much higher depending upon what they are constructed of. Since all tests thus far have shown that neither SCP-2251 nor SCP-2252 can be damaged or moved by any means known, the possibility also exists that neither object would be annihilated, halted, or altered from their course, even by contact with the other. If this is true, then a collision between SCP-2251 and SCP-2252 has the potential to data expunged. In this circumstance, planetary evacuation may not be sufficient, and data expunged should time permit before data expunged. Item number SCP-229 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures No electrical devices of any kind are allowed inside or within 30 meters of the containment area. Any and all personnel entering the containment area are to be clad in lead-lined clothing and helmets. Anything found to be infested by SCP-229 is to be immediately incinerated, and the resulting ash and debris contained and disposed of under Protocol XJR-99. 
containment area is to be composed of a hollow cube of 18 centimeter thick granite, 8 meters on a side, with a single door and airlock. These are to operate with no electrical components, and those components are to be made of wood or stone whenever possible. Any organism infested with SCP-229 is to be immediately incinerated. Any items or staff exiting the containment area must be scanned and cleared by site security. Description: SCP-229 appears to be a mass of wires and cables. Superficially, they appear to be raw copper wire, insulated ethernet cable, phone cable, power lines, and many other forms of electrical cable. The current mass weighs 94 kilograms at last measurement. SCP-229 is tentatively identified as a form of silicone-based life. SCP-229 is a highly invasive parasite, attacking anything carrying even a low electrical current. SCP-229 will grow several centimeters every hour and form connectors to attach to electrical power sources, wall socket plugs, USB connectors, etc. SCP-229 will also splice itself into power lines and existing wires if no connection is available. SCP-229 appears to feed off electricity. SCP-229 appears to go dormant when not in the presence of an electrical source. Any electrical current entering within 30 meters, no matter how small, will immediately cause SCP-229 to grow in the direction of the electricity. Questions regarding the possible intelligence and sensory organs of SCP-229 are still under investigation. SCP-229 appears to grow best on metal or plastic, but is very capable of infesting living tissue. In vertebrate animals, SCP-229 will quickly penetrate the epidermis and other tissues, attaching to and enveloping the spine. SCP-229 will then grow along nerve pathways and up into the brain attaching and infesting it within a few days. This process appears to be extremely painful and can cause very erratic behavior. When the infested subject nears death, usually from massive internal bleeding and brain damage, SCP-229 will exit the body by puncturing through the skin and attaching to any nearby structures, thus beginning the cycle again. It is theorized that SCP-229 has always been present in our ecosystem but that the technological level, and thereby the availability of electricity, was insufficient to allow its spread. With the current prevalence of wires and other electrical devices, detection can be extremely difficult. Incineration is currently the best means for SCP-229 removal. Addendum: At this time, cross-experimentation between SCP-229 and SCP-217 is allowed only with O5 approval. Item Number SCP-243 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-243 is to be secured in the geometric center of a standard containment cell, no less than 16 meters by 16 meters by 16 meters. The cell is to be connected to an adjacent room of similar size and composition by one standard lockable door. All exits to the cells are to be kept locked and guarded against unauthorized access. No eligible group, more than four identical inanimate objects, is permitted into the containment cell, nor any item capable of producing such a group, except as necessary for testing. Personnel entering the cell are subject to search and seizure of unauthorized multiples. Objects animated by SCP-243 are to be removed to the adjacent room for study. Undesirable animated items are to be disposed of promptly, by incineration if appropriate. In the event that SCP-243 is applied to other SCP objects, or to other items of similar value, the flock is to be separated and held in standard safe or Euclid-class inanimate item lockers, until the effects wear off. Following Incident 2432, bringing eligible groups of weapons, easily weaponized objects, or dry cell batteries into SCP-243's containment is strictly forbidden. Description: SCP-243 is a mass of small dry cell batteries, all fused at their negative terminals into an ellipsoid approximately 30 centimeters long by 10 centimeters diameter. The arrangement is semi-fluid. The batteries may be rearranged by applying gentle pressure 
though it is far more difficult to remove them from the central cylinder. SCP-243's unusual properties manifest when an eligible group of objects is brought into its active zone, an area of indeterminate shape, extending no more than 7.3 meters or less than 2.5 meters from the center of the item. The active zone's precise extent and shape change from minute to minute. An eligible group consists of five or more identical or nearly identical inanimate objects. Nearly identical items are those that a casual observer cannot easily distinguish based on attributes other than overall color. Eligible group members animate when brought into the active zone, displaying unusual flexibility and powers of levitation and locomotion. They acquire a few basic instincts, including self-preservation and variously complex flocking behavior. Objects' flocks range from simple separation alignment cohesion groups like flocks of birds or shoals of fish, to aggregates involving role specialization and formation of discrete subunits. Animated objects also, secondarily to flocking, tend to behave in ways thematically appropriate to an object of their type. Umbrellas form large shades, chairs make themselves available as seating, knives seek out objects to cut, etc. An item separated from the flock wanders aimlessly or searches for other flock members. Approximately four hours after separation, the item goes dormant and loses all apparent unusual properties. At this point, reuniting it with its group renders it animate again. 25 minutes after going dormant, it becomes permanently inanimate, losing all unusual properties and reverting to a normal object of its type. Whether intact or missing members, a flock deanimates permanently 24 plus or minus 2 hours after initial exposure to SCP-243. Flocks displaying complex shoaling behavior frequently fuse upon deanimation into aggregates representative of that behavior. Addendum: SCP-243 came to the Foundation's attention following a series of suspicious incidents involving animation studios. The unusually fluid, natural motion depicted in the cartoons produced would not ordinarily have attracted attention, but Data expunged, every desk lamp in the facility. The effects wore off in the usual 24 hours. Class A amnestics were administered to the animators involved and their families, all of whom remain under surveillance. Future productions are to be monitored carefully for evidence of further interference. Addendum 2 Given the release of Animation Studios film Knickknack prior to containment of SCP-243, in which a flamingo is one of several characters. It is currently hypothesized that SCP-243 may be a possible origin for SCP-1507. The style of movement observed in SCP-1507 instances matches movement observed from the character in the film, and the effects of SCP-243 would explain the former's flocking behaviors. If SCP-243 is the origin of SCP-1507, it is currently unknown why SCP-1507 has yet to deanimate, or if it will deanimate in accordance to SCP-243's behavior in the future. Item Number SCP-271 Object Class Catter Special Containment Procedures SCP-271 is to be stored as long as possible in Containment Unit Exclamation Point 12 on a meter-high stone pedestal SCP-2711, which will be flooded with water and sealed off in a hollow 5 centimeter thick sphere composed of glass saturated with iron. Permanent neodymium magnets will be mounted around the standard sized room to suspend the sphere in air and repel unwanted intruders. The room will be lined with pyrolytic carbon to contain the magnetic field generated by the magnets. The door to the room is to be left unguarded and disguised as an ordinary janitorial closet and kept locked by an unobtrusive password box mounted in the wall down the hallway and around the corner that appears to be a thermostat. Dr. Vig is to change the password on a monthly basis. All study is to be observation only until further notice. In case of unauthorized access, electromagnets in the room are to be activated by remote to destroy the glass sphere so that recovery may be simplified. Description SCP-271 is a small disk, composition unknown but metallic in nature, 
a little more than four centimeters in diameter, and engraved with a number of symbols that may or may not represent an unknown alphabet. These symbols are infectious to their environment over time, gradually appearing as if invisibly carved into nearby objects. They are capable of escaping through any hole, however minute, but have been demonstrated to be unable to penetrate non-gaseous fluids. Objects that carry the symbols for a sufficient time begin to change on a molecular level to the same material as the SCP. Both the engraving and petrification processes are extremely painful to biotic organisms. The only known method for purging the symbols is the destruction of the object, and it is not possible to do this to SCP-271 itself. At this time, both SCP-271 and SCP-2711 are thoroughly coated with the engraved symbols and seem to swim slightly. Dr. V and other observers have described them as looking like the far side of a heat wave, or not quite all there. The symbols also appear to have fractalized somewhat. Studies with vision-enhancing equipment have revealed miniature symbols inside and around the larger carvings on both objects. SCP-271 was a previously unknown SCP, recently acquired from a shrine belonging to the Church of the Broken God by Mobile Arm Task Force 12 when data expunged. It was previously stored in a room of its own, which documents note was to be kept sealed until the assembly was ready. The platform is original. On account of the extensive writing on the room in which it was contained, the shrine itself was pulverized. However, due to rapid retaliation by enemy forces, the remnants of MATF-12 were forced to data expunged. Contact has been re-established. But the nature of the SCP and the enemy seekers prevent easy recovery, and it is currently considered more advisable for the SCP to remain hidden, if comparatively unprotected, than to attract attention by launching a very expensive recovery mission. MATF-12 has been ordered to conform itself into CU-12, the exclamation mark denoting their atypical existence outside of a secured SCP Foundation area. Addendum. SCP-271 is not to be brought into the presence of SCP-882. Emergency Bulletin Reports from other embedded sources indicate that as of the Church is aware of CU-12 and the location of SCP-271 and is planning an imminent assault against the unit. SCP-271 is to be kept out of enemy hands at all costs. CU-12 has been ordered to mobilize and prepare for evacuation. A recovery team is being prepared for immediate deployment under the direction of Agent DuPont. A more detailed report is to follow. Item Number SCP-272 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-272 is to be contained in a small wooden box in a vault at Sector 25. Apart from this, no further containment is necessary as the object is completely inert when not in use. Care is to be taken not to drop the item during transit. Description SCP-272 is an iron nail, approximately 11.5 centimeters long, resembling ancient designs. Covering every flat surface are engravings of unknown cultural origin. The engravings have been described as captivating, but scary, in a majority of staff interviewed. The nature of the object becomes apparent when it is dropped onto the shadow of an individual. The nail will bury itself exactly two-thirds of its length into the material the shadow is cast on. Following this, two effects should be noted. The person whom the shadow belongs to will not be able to remove the nail by any means, and they are limited to movements that keep their shadow cast on the nail. The nail, however, may be removed by conventional means by anyone else although those requested to do so reported a mild aversion, citing claims that, quote, it feels fair. The object was discovered during a routine sweep embedded into an exposed rock face near an abandoned Air Force base in Afghanistan, with a human skeleton scattered around it. It was thought to be mundane, until a researcher dropped it at their feet, and was subsequently pinned to the spot for 20 minutes before being assisted. Experiment Log 272A Test Subject 1D Class Personnel D2721 Surface 
rock face at discovery site. Lighting. Midday sun. Directly overhead. Purpose. Establish nature of SCP. Procedure. Subject was handed the nail and told to hammer it into his shadow at his feet. Results. Subject complies. Once the nail had reached the two-third mark, subject could not continue. Subject attempts to move away, but is unable to. Subject soon becomes fatigued and succumbs to heat stroke. Object removed. Subject given medical treatment. Conclusions. Nature of the object established. 272B. Test subject. 1D class personnel. D2722. Surface. As above. Lighting. Night. Minimal. Purpose. Establish effects at night. Procedure. Nail was dropped at subject's feet and embedded itself exactly two-thirds of the way in. Subject then asked to move ten meters away from the nail. Results. Object embeds. Subject complies, showing no adverse effects. Subject then attempts to escape and is terminated. Object recovered. Conclusions. Subject is free to move when no shadow is cast. 272C. Test Subject. 1D Class Personnel. D2723. Surface. As above. Lighting. As above. Two hours before sunrise. Purpose. Establish effects of lighting changes. Procedure. Nail dropped as above. Subject told to walk in a straight line away from the nail. Results. Object embeds. Subject shows no adverse effects. Sunrise occurs at 6.06 .06 local time. Subject is data expunged. Three cleanup teams dispatched. Subject's torso recovered 106 meters from object, showing signs of road rash and severe blunt trauma. Object recovered. Testing moved to Sector 25. Conclusions. Data expunged. 272D. Test Subject. 1D Class Personnel. D2724. Surface. Concrete floor of Test Facility 25H. Lighting. One standard 60-watt light bulb, directly overhead. Purpose. Establish lighting requirements. Procedure. Nail dropped on the shadow of test subject. Subject told to walk in a straight line away from the object. Results. Object embeds. Subject is free to move. Object recovered. Conclusions. Insufficient lighting will cause no effect. 272E. Test subject. 1D class personnel. D2724. Surface. As above. Lighting. One standard 1500 watt stadium light. Directly overhead. Purpose. As above. Procedure. As above. Results. Object embeds. Subject trapped. Object recovered. Conclusions. Lighting requirements established. 272F. Test subject. 2D class. D2724 and D2725. Surface. As above. Lighting. Two stadium lights. Position 90 degrees apart. Purpose. Determine if multiple subjects can be held. Procedure. Subjects positioned so their shadows overlap. Object dropped onto both shadows. Subjects told to advance away from the nail. Results. Object embeds. Subject D2724 continues unhindered, but reports feeling a chill. D2725 is held by the object. Object recovered. Conclusions. Object cannot hold more than one subject. Potential secondary effect observed. 272G. Test subject. 8D class. D2724 through D2721. Surface. As above. Lighting. Four stadium lights. Positioned in a ring around the subjects. Purpose. Determine the selection mechanism for which subject is held. 
Procedure Subjects position so their shadows overlap. Nail dropped onto all eight shadows. Results Object embeds. Subject D2729 is held. 18 years of age. Caucasian. 1.8 meters. 88 kilograms. All others free to move. Reports of a scream from all subjects except D2729. All subjects except D2729 seem to shiver. Object recovered. D2729 removed from study. Experiment repeated. Subject D2726 held. 24 years of age. Hispanic. 1.6 meters. 102 kilograms. All others appear to shiver and report a scream, but remain free. Experiment repeated four additional times as per the above method. Discontinued after D2727 fell unconscious. Subject given treatment for severe hypothermia. Conclusions Emerging patterns suggest that the youngest possible subject to be held will be. Additionally, secondary effect on larger groups observed. Further research pending acquisition of a larger sample group. Addendum Subjects of equal gender distribution, ages ranging from 18 to 59, numerous physical traits represented. 272H Test Subject 1D Class D2725 Surface 1 Outdoor Field Grassy Lighting Early Morning Sun Approximately 9 AM Purpose To determine if subject can escape by digging. Procedure Object dropped onto subject's shadow. Subject then given a shovel and told to dig out the object. Results Subject digs for 90 seconds, then falls over screaming. Subject expires before medical intervention could be administered. Autopsy reveals subject died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Cause indeterminate. Object recovered. Field repaired. Repeated with D2727 and 8. Results identical. Conclusions Subjects held by SCP-272 cannot dig the nail out. Attempting to do so is invariably fatal. 272I Test subject None Surface N.A. Lighting N.A. Purpose To determine the object's destructibility. Procedure 1 D-Class Personnel D2729 is given the object and a selection of tools and told to go to town in an attempt to destroy the object. Test area evacuated. Results Subject selected an angle grinder, set the object in a vise, and proceeded to bring the grinder upon the object. An instant later, subject is seen writhing on the ground, clutching his temples. Audio recordings from inside the room record subject speaking in- 30 seconds later, subject expires. Autopsy reveals the cause to be a cerebral hemorrhage. Examination of the object reveals some minor damage from the grinder. Conclusions Object appears to be fully destructible, but will resist actions against it with lethal force by an unknown method. Object tested to maintain its original functionality. 272J Test Subject 1 D-Class Personnel D-27210 Surface Concrete Floor of Test Facility 25H Lighting One stadium light positioned on a computer-controlled track. Purpose A. Determine the effects of rapid lighting shifts. And B. Determine if subject can be withheld from the object via restraints, barriers, etc. Procedure Test 1. Light position to cast a long shadow. Nail dropped into the head of the subject's shadow. Light slowly raised. Results Test 1. Subject dragged at a proportional rate towards the object. Subject has difficulty standing. Procedure Test 2. As above. Light raised very rapidly. Results Test 2. As above, but at a more rapid rate. Noted that subject was unable to remain standing and accelerated upon falling. Attributed to the decrease in shadow size relative to standing. Subject acquired minor road rash. Procedure Test 3 As above 
Subject restrained with chains attached to their feet. Chicken wire screen placed between subject and object. Results. Test 3. Data expunged. Subject expires. Object recovered. Further testing with restrained subjects prohibited. Conclusions. Subjects seem to be dragged by their shadow, at a rate required to keep it cast upon the object. Intervening obstacles appear not to impede this function, although will damage the subject, or in the case of barriers like the chicken wire. Data expunged. 272H Test Subject 1D Class Personnel D2724 Surface As above Lighting 1 Stadium Light in a fixed position, roughly 45 degrees from horizontal Purpose Establish the effects of long-term containment Procedure D2724 positioned central to the room Object is dropped onto the subject's shadow. Results. Subject held. After the third day, subject becomes unresponsive to attempts to provide nourishment. After the first week, subject heard to only speak. By the eleventh day, the subject, having not eaten or drank in eight days, seemed to become agitated, rapidly shifting between mania and a comatose state. At the fourteen-day mark, the test is terminated. Object recovered. Subject noted to be severely malnourished, but resumed speaking English once the object is removed and proceeded to recover rapidly before monthly termination. Conclusions Extended containment has yielded that the subject will survive for prolonged periods without nourishment, but will enter a degraded mental state. Addendum Partial transcript of Subject D-2724's manic speaking from Day 14 Translated sections and curly brackets. Begin transcript. Dr. Kimiro, for the record, state your name. D2724. Ashes burn at my tongue, I cannot taste the water boils at my sight. Dr. Kimiro, can you repeat that? D2724. I cannot sleep, the screams are heard, I am not the worm the shadow steals. Dr. Kimiro, right. How do you feel? D2724. The chains they bind, I cannot move the people. Data expunged. Dr. Kimiro. What is he saying? What is he speaking? Someone get me a translator. D2724. Growing louder. Cut my flesh to ribbons that I might be free. Subject begins clawing at his skin. Data expunged. I am the prisoner of my own foolishness, let the crows come, and data expunged. Let my flesh crumble like the apple whose ashes burn at my tongue. End transcript. Item number. SCP-287. Object class. Safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-287 is stored in a climate-controlled secure locker in Site-22 in order to prevent additional deterioration. At this time, no additional testing is required, but may be approved by Dr. Sigurd Olafsson. Sources of electricity are to be kept away from SCP-287's locker at all times. If testing with SCP-287 is required, insulated gloves are to be worn to prevent accidental discharge into the hilt. SCP-2871's remains are to be kept in storage until further notice. Research requests for SCP-2871 can be routed to Dr. Zarshin and are restricted to Level 4 personnel or Level 2 personnel from the Exobiology Department. Description SCP-287 is a Viking arming sword measuring 78 centimeters from pommel to tip and weighing 1,077 grams. SCP-287 is in a state of significant decay due to exposure to outside elements for anywhere from 900 to 1100 years. SCP-287 was found in Iceland, alongside several written records. SCP-287 is comprised primarily of iron, with several potentially anomalous components incorporated into its structure. Several of these materials have been detected by Foundation probes traveling within extrasolar regions of our galaxy as well as probes which 
Carbon dating has placed SCP-287's creation to around the early 10th century CE. Samples of exoplanetary metals and materials have proven to be more difficult to date, and analysis is ongoing. SCP-287's anomalous effect can be observed when an electrical current is applied through the metallic portions of the hilt, exposed just below the guard. These exposed elements are in a noticeably better state than the iron portions of SCP-287. SCP-287's internal components will begin to emit several frequencies of EM radiation and varying sounds, invariably described as distressing by research staff and test subjects. Radiation produced by SCP-287 causes all humans who are exposed to it to experience acute audiovisual hallucinations and severe headaches. SCP-287's specific hallucination takes the form of translucent human-like figures in the immediate vicinity, invariably outfitted as members of an armed force. The armament and armor worn by SCP-287's hallucinations varies by subject, but with a general trend towards the individual's perception of what they consider to be modern armament. Testing with animals as well as non-anomalous EM fields and sounds of the exact same frequencies do not produce the same effect in any combination of cases. Higher amperage currents have increased this effect to a maximum of 437 individual hallucinations. Further testing was deemed unnecessary. SCP-2871 is believed to be an extraterrestrial organism found in the same location as SCP-287. The exact origin of SCP-2871 is unknown at this time. A full report on SCP-2871 can be found in document R27-287-1. SCP-2871 is potential spacecraft designated SCP-2872, appears to be completely destroyed. The current working hypothesis for SCP-2872 is that it was intended as some form of escape pod from a larger vessel. Discovery SCP-287 was recovered from a burial mound outside of Iceland on January 2000. The remains found within the tomb proved to be non-human and the Foundation took custody of SCP-287, and the remains were designated SCP-2871. SCP-2871's remains are skeletal and are humanoid, though significantly different from human skeletal structure. Additionally, several written sources were found within the tomb and acquired by the Foundation. Dr. Sigurd Olofsson was consulted to help translate the writing enclosed in Addendum A. Addendum A prepared by the Department of Terra Linguistics. The discovery of SCP-287 was predicated upon reports of ghost soldiers in an area outside of Iceland. A recent storm had struck the burial mound containing SCP-287, conducting current into SCP-287 through a crude lightning rod made of iron. The hallucinations created by SCP-287 affected an amateur film crew. The crew informed local authorities and Foundation information gathering subroutines flagged these reports as potentially anomalous. Keywords Ghost, Spectre, Crazy, Kids, Hallucination, with a double correlation factor of Gamma 6. Class A amnestics were administered to all witnessing parties, and the burial site was declared a heritage dig site through a Foundation Shell Corporation. Within the burial mound, Foundation agents discovered SCP-287, SCP-2871, and additional written materials dating back to the early 10th century CE. A transcription was created by Dr. Sigurd Olofsson. Unintelligible sections are most likely proper nouns, with no direct translation. I am Halvor Scottison, Scald of Unintelligible, and I have been trusted with the tale of Thor's champion, the Meteor Lord. In the depths of winter, the year after the Great Raid, we saw a fiery meteor in the sky. It landed deep in the heart of the northern wastes, and we followed it. A wondrous thing it was, gleaming and covered in ghost lights. We approached and found a man standing in a heavy cloak, examining the meteor. The ghost lights went dark, and the figure pressed his hand to the outside of the star. A wondrous light filled our eyes as the star opened. He disappeared into the meteor, 
and emerged to look at us with such fiery determination in his eyes. We knew he could only be a king, sent to us from Odin himself. He would protect us from the raids, and we would know prosperity again. Our prayers had been answered. Daily did the elders of our village come to his resting site, but his tongue was blessed only to speak the language of the Aesir. Weeks passed as he learned our language. When he learned of our plight, he appeared to grow angry and charged back to the meteor to fashion himself a mighty weapon with which to defend the village. Weeks later, he emerged with a sword in his hand, gleaming and mighty. He held it aloft and his power was made manifest. Ghostly warriors, heroes from Valhalla stood around him, brandishing weapons. We threw ourselves to the ground, our heads aching with the glory of these Valhalla warriors, and this pleased the Meteor Lord. For years, when the raids came, we ran in supplication to the Meteor Lord. He emerged, and all fled from his flashing blade and burning eyes. We marked the way to the Meteor Lord's home with the Cairn Stones. During the Battle of Unintelligible, the Meteor Lord's fall came. His powers failed him, and Odin recalled him to Valhalla. We buried him with all the honor we could muster, and fashioned a conduit for the great storms from Thor. On stormy nights, the heroes still come and watch over our village, their glory splitting the head of any man who dare look upon them. Addendum B. Prepared by the Department of Exolinguistics. Tracing back from the story presented in the included writings, Foundation agents tracked down the meteor mentioned in the epic translated by Dr. Olafsson. Excavating the object in question led to an almond-shaped craft made of an unknown material. Research regarding this craft can be found in document R27-287. Within the craft, several records were found written in an unknown language upon crude paper. It is hypothesized that this is some kind of journal of SCP-2871. An exact translation is nearly impossible. However, using a partial translation has been attempted. Timestamp. Unknown symbology. Unknown place. Unknown people. Primitive. Violent. Untranslated didn't survive. Everything is lost. Must find a way back. Too many counting on me. Timestamp. Unknown symbology theorized to be several days later. They found me. Managed to put together untranslated hood. They won't see me. Must learn their language. Must keep them away from me. Unknown biology. May infect. Timestamp. Unknown symbology theorized to be several weeks later. I see their weapons, mine non-functional, made one like theirs, used last of the untranslated, tuned to alien brain chemistry, hope it scares them off, not sure how much longer I can work on untranslated, not having most likely a proper noun, nearby is unbearable, dying, breaking, timestamp, unknown symbology, unknown time, they came back. I use the weapon, scares them. Untranslated, almost done, may be able to leave. Down to 16 cells, items, spheres. Timestamp, unknown symbology, unknown time. They brought others. I scared them again. Not sure if I can repair the untranslated. Thought I had enough. Closest match was a chemical formula matching SCP-148. Used most likely a proper nouns. Necklace. Still not enough. Timestamp. Unknown symbology theorized to be several years later. Won't stop coming. Only one cells, items, spheres. Left. Time running out. Power nearly gone. I can't repair. Untranslated. Too many. Unit of time. It is hypothesized that at this point, whatever power source SCP-2871 was using to activate SCP-287 ran out. SCP-2871 was most likely killed during the next raid, without SCP-287 to protect them. Item Number SCP-290 Object Class 
Safe. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-290 is to be held in a 5 meter by 5 meter by 5 meter cell at Site-19. Personnel are forbidden from interacting with SCP-290, except during an approved testing procedure, and any personnel who attempt to do so must be terminated with any force necessary. During any interaction with SCP-290, three guards with full knowledge of the object must flank the object's aperture. Anyone other than Class D personnel attempting to enter must be removed from the object's cell. Subjects who undergo reconfiguration are terminated at the conclusion of experimentation. Description SCP-290 is a hollow metallic sphere, 3 meters in diameter, with a circular opening of diameter 90 centimeters cut into one side. This sphere is welded to four metal posts, 50 centimeters in height. Scans have shown that SCP-290 is composed of a combination of aluminum and data expunged, many of which do not match any known atomic structure. All attempts to take samples of the metal for more detailed analysis have failed. The external temperature of the sphere remains constant at 318 Kelvin, or 45 degrees Celsius, regardless of the ambient conditions. As no power source for the device has been found, how it maintains this temperature is as yet unknown. Researchers have noted that personnel appear to display slightly elevated curiosity about SCP-290's function, although whether this is evidence of a psychological effect or simply due to its abnormality is not known. Should a subject enter SCP-290 through the circular opening, the aperture will shrink rapidly, rendering the inside section inaccessible. After 5 to 20 minutes, the aperture will reopen. No sound can be heard emanating from SCP-290 during this period. Subjects emerge from this process alive, conscious, albeit often in a state of extreme distress, but with their anatomy significantly altered. Limbs, facial features, and appear to be relocated randomly, yet without losing functionality. Fingers and toes are often removed from the hands and feet, and eyes rarely remain in a configuration lending itself to binocular vision. Almost all subjects report pain and discomfort in breathing and movement, if either remain possible, with most unable to walk or perform any type of effective locomotion. Autopsies performed on afflicted subjects reveal that a similar reconfiguration occurs internally, with organ placement changed and blood vessels and nerves lengthened to fit the new arrangement. Evidence of severe internal bleeding and hemorrhage of other bodily fluids is often present, although subjects display none of the connected symptoms on retrieval from SCP-290, and no subject has died as a direct result of exposure to the object. Subjects' bones show evidence of large-scale fracturing but also rapid healing, ostensibly a part of the modification process. Subjects remain conscious throughout the reconfiguration. Addendum 291 Experiment Log Subject D-59414 Male 18 Supervisor Dr. S. SCP-290 Lead Researcher Purpose Ascertain the experiences of subjects within SCP-290. Procedure D-59414 was exposed to SCP-290, having had no prior experience with the object. Subject immediately inquired as to its function, to which Dr. S replied, That is what we intend to find out. After several subsequent inquiries from the subject were rebuffed, subject was provided with an IR-sensitive video camera and ordered to enter the object. Subject complied without resistance. Aperture reopened 17.4 minutes after closure, and subject and video camera were retrieved. The video camera was heavily damaged during the experiment due to the subject's violent convulsions, and around 65% of the footage is unintelligible. A transcript of the video feed recovered from the camera follows. Video feed initially shows subject sitting calmly in the center of SCP-290, looking around and examining his surroundings by touch at intervals. This continues for around two minutes, at which point the subject begins clutching his chest and groaning. Subject then begins to scream, including the phrase, I was only curious, but I know now. Please, let me go. 
Whether this indicates a secondary consciousness inhabiting the subject's mind with which he was conversing is unknown. It is at this point that the subject begins flailing, impacting the camera repeatedly and causing it to record only small fragments of footage. Fragments of interest are noted below, in chronological order. Subject's head appears to be slowly embedding itself into his thigh, both eyes absent. Subject's fingers visible on his torso. Subject's eye moving across his right foot, eyeball changing orientation rapidly as it does so. Subject lying in a pattern reminiscent of the fetal position, slow breathing audible. End transcript. A debriefing interview was scheduled, but owing to the subject's larynx being relocated away from his trachea, could not be conducted. Autopsy showed wide-scale reorganization of the subject's internal organs, including small-scale fusing of parts of the small intestine and data expunged, resulting in contamination of the chest cavity data expunged. Despite this, the subject had a normal volume of blood within his circulatory system, and levels of other bodily fluids such as bile were within normal parameters. How SCP-290 maintains or replenishes these fluids is unknown. Item Number SCP-302 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-302 is to be kept in sight under Safe 3 protocols. Artifacts should be handled with gloves at all times and utmost precautions should be taken to ensure that the artifact does not make skin contact with unauthorized personnel. Any personnel not scheduled for testing that begin showing signs of SCP-302's effects may apply for termination. All subjects suffering from SCP-302's affliction should be terminated after no longer than eight days due to data expunged. Description SCP-302 is a small tin sculpture with a bronze patina finish depicting two ants carrying a leaf. Whenever a human makes direct skin contact with the artifact, they will invariably find a single, small, relatively harmless ant on their person within two hours. This ant may belong to any of several different small ant species, and its appearance rarely causes much alarm. It is of note that in all recorded cases, Subjects have always distinctly noticed this first ant and fully remember seeing it. Thereafter, an exponentially increasing number of ants will appear on the exposed subject by day. Throughout the entire day, the number of ants that appear seems to be in the range of 3x to 5x, where x is the number of days since initial contact with SCP-302. As time progresses, the ants not only increase in number, but also change in species. Smaller, minimally harmful species appear at first, later transitioning to larger species, or species with more painful stings or bites. Ants seem to appear out of the nearest unobserved space. This includes from under clothes, nearby objects, or, if left with no alternatives, bodily orifices. Ants seem singularly preoccupied with exploring or attacking the affected individual and will not stop until either themselves or the subject is deceased. Addendum 3021 Subject of Test Log 2 was a single D-Class personnel. Subject was told he was to participate in a study testing how a week of relaxation might affect the performance of D-Class personnel and was kept in a relaxation chamber with exercise equipment, various books and magazines, and a color television. Subject was exposed to SCP-302 without his knowledge. Test Log 2 Days 1 and 2 Subject spends his time in leisurely pursuits. Subject expresses great satisfaction and reports nothing out of the ordinary. Day 3 Subject reports small ant problem and admits it is probably his fault for letting crumbs fall all over the couch and carpet. Subject admits he noticed an ant two days previous, but did not think it was worth mentioning. Subject reports great satisfaction otherwise, and requests a can of bug spray. Day 4 Subject reports that ant problem persists despite his best efforts to spray the room, and that the ants have become more numerous, and occasionally painful. 
Subject reports that the ants seem bigger and different from those he saw the day before. Subject still reports relative happiness with the experiment. Day 5 Subject reports great annoyance and increased pain, as ants are now nearly always on his person. Ants seem to have changed once more, becoming more aggressive and agitated. At this point, Subject clearly suspects ants are not of a normal nature. Day 6 Subject in great pain On average, five tropical greenhead ants are seen to appear every minute on Subject throughout entire day. Subject becomes aggressive due to pain and demands to be released from chamber. Pretense for experiment is dropped and Subject is restrained and given medical attention. Day 7 Subject in great pain An average of 25 tropical fire ants are seen to appear every minute on Subject. Subject requires continuous ant removal. Day 8 Subject is heavily medicated and unconscious through majority of day. An average of 140 bullet ants appear on subject each minute. Rapid ant removal and anti-inflammatory medicine is necessary. Day 9. Data expunged. Subject and experiment are terminated. Item Number SCP-314 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-314 is contained at the location of its original discovery, at Site-47, which has been built around the anomaly. Local personnel publicly operate under the guise of the U.S. Forest Service. Although SCP-314 is highly mobile, it has never moved beyond a 50-meter radius of its origin point. The area delineated by this radius is known as the Red Zone. SCP-314 has created an equally large depression in the Earth below its origin point. All attempts to remove or restrain the object have thus far failed, but containment has been achieved by the construction of Site-47 itself, which is also used for various physics experiments regarding anomalous objects. Any experiments involving SCP-314 must be cleared by Dr. Williams. With the exception of approved experimentation, all personnel are to keep clear of the red zone. SCP-314 is highly reactive to all motion within approximately 52 meters of its origin point. Addendum After Incident 314-OE, researchers are reminded that the object's kill radius is approximately 50 meters from point of origin and for purposes of safety should be assumed to actually be 51 meters. Although safe interaction is possible at the outer edge of the red zone, and the object may even exhibit what the late Dr. Stratham described as playful behavior at that range, all action within the kill radius has always been met with violent reaction. Description SCP-314 is a 0.97 meter long, 0.21 meter thick obelisk, which is highly reflective and metallic in appearance with tapered edges that are apparently sharpened to a molecular level. No material has ever been recovered from SCP-314. The object is capable of levitation and extremely swift motion, although it lacks any visible means of locomotion. Although research does not indicate any true intelligence, the object is most certainly sentient of its surroundings and extremely reactive to any motions or vibrations within an approximate 50... 52 meter radius. Analysis of rubble recovered from the ground below SCP-314's origin point indicates that the object arrived at this location sometime between 1975 and 1979, which is supported by pre-containment reports from civilians. The object emits no unusual radiation, save for a very faint sound which appears to be an anomalous broadcast of FM, a local classic rock station. Comparisons between SCP-314's vibrations and the actual broadcast of FM are identical approximately 85% of the time, although recordings from SCP-314 often include extra audio in the form of guttural sounds, snarling, and occasional commentary from the late DJ who passed away in 1998 and was not employed with FM after 1983. Research Summary 
SCP-314 reacts to all motion within its kill radius by impacting the source of movement, although it ignores particulate matter smaller than 125 micrometers. SCP-314 will continue to react in this manner until the triggering object no longer moves, has exited the kill radius, or has been reduced to pieces small enough to be ignored. It displays unerring accuracy. No limit to its speed has yet been established. Current experimentation revolves around introducing multiple targets into SCP-314's kill radius at a time to quantify its method of identifying, prioritizing, and reacting to multiple targets. Multiple slow-moving targets are often struck down in order of their introduction to the kill zone, notably in a method which suggests that SCP-314 is anticipating for their objects to be introduced. In Experiment 314-113, several tennis balls were tossed into the kill radius by researchers standing outside the red zone. SCP-314 bisected each ball neatly, in such a manner that their remaining momentum took them out of the kill radius, while putting itself into position to strike balls not yet thrown. SCP-314 has correctly predicted when a researcher will only pretend to throw an object, as well as when a researcher will fail to throw an object into the kill radius, despite intent. Multiple fast-moving targets, such as bullets fired into the kill radius, can produce speeds from SCP-314 that exceed the sound barrier, or even create the appearance of SCP-314 existing in more than one location simultaneously. Experiment 314-230 flooded the containment room within Site-47. SCP-314 was able to strike at the encroaching liquid with such speed and consistency that it created an irregularly shaped dry sphere within its kill radius. The ground below SCP-314 remained dry at all times. In previous tests and accidents, SCP-314 has allowed liquid to fall upon the ground within its kill zone. When SCP-314 detects motion close to the edge of the kill radius, it moves in erratic patterns that observers have variously interpreted as threatening, graceful, or playful. These motions sometimes correspond to the individuals that provoke them, suggesting that SCP-314 may have some means of recognizing or remembering individuals to whom it has previously been exposed. Containment Breach 7-12-2000 At approximately 3.23 p.m. local time, SCP-314 exited its previously defined area of operation and cut through the walls of Site-47 before returning to its place of origin. No personnel were harmed during this event. This time corresponded with an off-site review on whether or not SCP-314 should be reclassified as safe. Whether this is coincidence or not is yet to be determined, but it clearly demonstrates that we do not know everything about this object or its motivations, or if it is capable of having any. Classification remains Euclid. Dr. Williams. Item Number SCP-316 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-316 needs no special containment, other than to prevent misuse by unauthorized personnel. Those operating SCP-316 should wear highly reflective full-body wear to prevent accidental exposure. Personnel privy to sensitive information should be kept out of visual range of SCP-316 due to its ability to induce a suggestive state. Description SCP-316 is a bronze-aged carbide lamp. The casing corresponds to no manufactured models and appears to be homemade. The bulb is ordinary and can be replaced without impeding the function of SCP-316. Internal circuitry of SCP-316 is constructed of an unknown metal rather than copper. The casing has a battery compartment, which takes two D batteries. SCP-316 does not function unless two D batteries are in the battery compartment with their positive ends facing each other. When switched on, SCP-316's bulb emits a nearly opaque beam of white light. Non-reflective objects and materials in contact with this light have their molecular structure rearranged into patterns which homogenize reflected photons, distributing their wavelengths equally throughout the visual spectrum. Effectively, 
over approximately six cumulative seconds of exposure. Affected surfaces lose all color, retaining shades of gray of the same luminosity as the original surface. Reflective surfaces remain unaffected, but appear to stop SCP-316's light, rather than reflecting it. SCP-316 has a temporary but more drastic effect on living or sentient organisms. Its effect is spread evenly across an organism, even internally, as long as part of the organism is exposed to its light. Effects set in over approximately 27 cumulative seconds of exposure and gradually wear off over the next 24 hours. In addition to loss of color, most affected organisms experience the following. Color blindness. Lower body temperature. Low energy. Slowed movements. Monotonic slurred speech. Inattentiveness. Short-term memory loss. Apathy. Lack of aggression. Negligible emotional response. Passive cooperation with instructions. Relative lack of desire to lie or deceive. Limited capacity for foresight or creative thought. After recovering from the effects of SCP-316, most subjects report symptoms of nausea and depression for up to one week. Almost all subjects, once recovered, volunteer their displeasure at having been exposed to SCP-316 and may violently resist further exposure. Cross-experimentation between SCP-316 and uncooperative living SCPs for the purposes of pacification has been approved. Addendum 316A SCP-316 was recovered from the residence of a colorblind man arrested for counterfeiting in Texas. The man had reportedly attempted to pay for items at a convenience store with colorless bills. A Secret Service investigator noted the apparent quality and validity of the bills, as well as the ink's chemical equivalency with Federal Ink, and the Foundation investigated. The subject's house was mostly colorless, as it seemed he had been using SCP-316 to navigate at night. Neighbors reported the subject to have been withdrawn and depressingly dull. Subject was terminated and his property destroyed. Addendum 316B Experiment Log of Dr. Blast Testing SCP-316 on Sentient SCPs Date Undisclosed Exposure to Aggressive Humanoid SCPs Experiment 1 Exposure to SCP-213 Full effects of SCP-316 confirmed after 25 seconds of exposure. SCP-213 exhibits normal symptoms of exposure. Subject is still able to disintegrate matter when ordered to do so, but to a diminished extent, approximately 9% normal speed. Testing concluded. After recovery, subject shows a willingness to comply with Foundation commands to avoid future exposure to SCP-316. Note, my heart nearly jumped out when he started melting matter, but scares aside, this test has proven very useful. We can use SCP-316 to ensure cooperation when these SCPs disagree with us, and then hold it over their heads like a whip when they think of doing it again. Dr. Blast Experiment 2 Exposure to SCP-076-2 Able Full effects of SCP-316 confirmed after 30 seconds of exposure. SCP-076-2 enters a catatonic stupor, still upright. At 49 seconds, subject proceeds to dispassionately kill all nearby personnel. Kill switch activated remotely by Dr. Blast. Assistants to Dr. Blast note him hammering kill switch frantically for up to 16 seconds after SCP-076-2 was pacified. Testing suspended. After revival, when questioned, SCP-076-2 remarked that SCP-316 had made him feel extremely bored. What else was I supposed to do? Note, Jesus, I guess monsters don't react the same way to this thing. It's a good thing I opted to stay in Site-17 during the procedure. Dr. Blast Note 
Dr. Blast will be supervising all further SCP-316 testing remotely, as with the previous procedure. Data expunged. Experiment 5. Exposure to SCP-56. Full effects of SCP-316 confirmed after 30 seconds of exposure. SCP-56 changes into a gray replica of one of the researchers in the testing room, shifting between several of them as tests are conducted. Personality and effects of subject remain unchanged. Only the physical form appears to be affected. As researchers read out results for Dr. Blast, viewing remotely via camera, SCP-56 takes the form of Dr. Blast. Microphone in Dr. Blast's area records him shouting an expletive and falling over with his chair. Testing concluded. Note. Nobody told me this thing could breach camera transmissions. I've probably been mentally breached as well. I can feel it already, damn it. My head's probably going to explode. This thing can destroy brains, right? Who the hell designed 56's containment procedures anyway? Damn it. I can't move. I can't f***ing move. Wheel me down to the infirmary. Hurry! Dr. Blast. Note. Medical personnel found no physical or mental problems with Dr. Blast. Research assistant has requested a transfer. Data expunged. Experiment 8. Exposure to SCP-343. Data expunged and riots in Italy, which data expunged. Effects of in Site 17. Dr. Blast informed of results after regaining consciousness. Further testing attempts suspended. Note. As we informed you the sixth time, Dr. Blast, under no conditions are we approving your emergency transfer requests. O5. Note. What the fuck is he doing with a safe classification? Tell O5 I'm not supervising tests on anything outside of my security clearance again, damn it. Dr. Blast. Experiment 9. Exposure to SCP-6621. Mr. Deeds. Full effects of SCP-316 confirmed after 28 seconds of exposure, to which the subject exhibits normal symptoms. Subject is asked to explain his origin and other previously unobtainable information. Subject remains silent and unresponsive. Administering researcher asks subject to obtain a glass of lemonade, to which he responds that he is tired and would rather not. Researcher insists. Subject leaves in the expected manner and returns with a glass on a tray, which is empty, save for three cubes of ice and a wedge of lemon. Upon questioning, subject responds that he was thirsty. When dismissed and summoned again with SCP-662, subject returns free of symptoms and immediately apologizes to researcher for his unprofessional conduct. When asked about the effects of exposure to SCP-316, subject replied that they were unpleasant. Testing concluded. Note. Cheeky bastard. Dr. Blast. Awaiting declassification. Item number. SCP-339. Object Class. Keter. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-339 is contained at Site-49. The room containing SCP-339 is 5 meters by 5 meters by 5 meters and soundproofed. SCP-339 is sealed in a soundproofed container on a 1.5 meter pedestal in the center of the room. The room is only accessible through an outer soundproofed airlock. All personnel entering SCP-339's holding room for maintenance must maintain absolute silence and wear noise-reducing foam-lined boots, available in the airlock. Regular maintenance of SCP-339 is to occur on the 15th of every month, and consists of replacing the degraded soundproof container with a new one. No one is to enter SCP-339's holding room for any reason other than maintenance. Description SCP-339 is a group of tendrils extending off a central mass. It is approximately 50 centimeters from tip to tip, although this is variable. It appears to be made out of weathered copper, but shows a much higher level of durability and independent mobility. The individual tendrils constantly move as though underwater, continuously grinding on the sides of any containment, 
silently pulverizing it at a gradual but constant rate. Because of this, the soundproofed box it is currently contained in must be replaced at regular intervals. Any noise above 14 decibels will cause SCP-339 to become hostile. During this noise, and for a length of time equal to five times the duration of the noise, any movement within visual range will result in the immediate reaction of SCP-339. SCP-339 will expand by extruding tendrils at an extremely high rate, ensnaring any moving organisms or objects, designated targets. Once the movement has been restricted, SCP-339's tendrils begin to vibrate at rapidly increasing oscillations until the target is rendered incapable of movement. Note that once a target is ensnared, SCP-339 appears to be able to determine when the target truly becomes incapable of movement, rather than merely when it stops moving. SCP-339 will then return to its base shape and size. At this point, secretions of blood and a slurry of bone and muscle tissue from the central mass are to be expected. All movements of SCP-339 are completely silent, even at very high oscillations that should produce noise. History SCP-339 was recovered in Iran in 1953 during Operation Ajax on the part of the Iranian military. It was found in one of Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh's private collections. After the deaths of the Iranian soldiers sent to secure this collection, the Foundation was alerted and took control. SCP-339 was found in a velvet-draped room on a pedestal. A quote from the Persian poet Saadi was engraved onto the pedestal in Persian. Nothing is so good for an ignorant man as silence, and if he was sensible of this, he would not be ignorant. Item Number SCP-341 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures The Exhibition Hall of Reliquary Research and Containment Site 76 has SCP-341 on display for all research and command personnel to view. Description A collection of eleven brass and iron orreries found in a large storage room of a basement at Oxford comprise SCP-341. Each orrery is a rough-scale model of a different extrasolar star system, complete with planets, moons, and one or more suns in the center. A unique clockwork mechanism under each orrery allows the brass models of planets and moons to spin on axis and rotate around each model of its parent stars. Testing dates each machine to be between 150 to 200 years old, but without any specific markings, researchers have been unable to determine who created them. The orrery collection of SCP-341 was set to be released into the hands of a local museum until an SCP astronomer with a piqued interest in the discovery recognized one of the Ories, SCP-341-E, as star system Upsilon Andromedae A, unique for being a solar twin of our own sun, with hot Jupiter-like planets. Further research has matched five of the eleven Ories with possible known extrasolar systems, including Beta Canum Venaticorum, 37 Geminorum, HD 98618 18 Scorpii One orrery, known as the Wheel of Doom amongst researchers, depicts a similar solar system very reminiscent of our own souls. Though the planets and sun themselves are neither near to scale nor space proportionately, the presence of seven major planets of our own system is fairly obvious, including Saturn and its rings, and the tilted side of Uranus. There are also five minor planets included beyond the orbit of Neptune. The orrery is missing a model of Earth, and instead has a free moon roaming through a debris field, similar to the asteroid belt present between Mars and Jupiter. Item Number SCP-359 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-359 is to be contained within a 30 meter by 30 meter by 30 meter concrete structure. This structure is not to be entered between the hours of 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. local standard time. Any monitoring of SCP-359 during these hours is to be done via security cameras installed within the structure. 
SCP-359 is to be fed one adult pig every other day. Acceptable substitutions to this diet must be cleared with Agent and Dr. All remnants of SCP-359's prey are to be completely cleaned out of the containment structure by 8.45 p.m. the following day. Description SCP-359 appears to be a metal sculpture of a red-tailed hawk with a wingspan of approximately 4.3 meters, perched atop a 12-meter arch. During daylight hours, approximately 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. local standard time, it displays no signs of movement and does not respond to any external stimuli. However, it has been determined by the Foundation that between the hours of 9 p.m. and 6 a.m., it displays the typical behaviors of an adult red-tailed hawk, apart from being nocturnal. SCP-359 is apparently capable of flight. The mechanisms through which it accomplishes this have not been determined, as its wings are too short to allow for flight. SCP-359 was originally located just south of in the United States. It first came to the Foundation's attention when local foresters began finding dead bodies of white-tailed deer, Otocoileus virginianus, in the area, within a one-kilometer radius of the sculpture which looked to have been preyed upon. The white-tailed deer has no natural predators in the state of <laughs> Investigation officially began when motorists on the stretch of state route <laughs> that passes by SCP-359 reported that the hawk was not on top of the arch. On the same day, a local farmer reported finding the sculpture in his field, standing over the body of one of his cows, which had injuries consistent with predation by a large bird of prey. The farmer was administered a Class A amnestic and fed the story that the cow had died of natural causes and its body eaten by coyotes. Route was closed for repairs, and SCP-359 was transferred to its current containment site and replaced with an immobile replica. Addendum 1 Prior to containment, no evidence existed that SCP-359 had ever attempted to prey on anything besides hoofed mammals. However, since being contained, it has attacked, killed, and eaten four D-Class personnel who entered its containment structure during restricted hours. Investigation into the cause of this shift in dietary preferences is ongoing. Item Number SCP-361 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-361 is to be kept in a standard artifact containment unit in Site-19's High Value Wing. SCP-361 is to be kept in a cool and dry environment to prevent damage to the aged metal it is composed of and thoroughly cleaned after each use. Description SCP-361 is a bronze Etruscan artifact in the shape of a sheep's liver. SCP-361 is covered in the names of Etruscan gods and instructions for various religious rites, and is believed to have served as a tool for practicing haruspicy, divination using animal organs. SCP-361 bears a strong resemblance to the non-anomalous artifact known as the Liver of Piacenza, with which it was originally found during the late 19th century. Both artifacts date to the 2nd and 3rd century BCE, to the province of Piacenza, Italy. SCP-361's anomalous properties manifest if it comes into contact with the sheep's liver, removed no more than three hours before interacting with SCP-361. When such contact is made, SCP-361 will vocalize, in a language and tone appropriate to the one introducing the liver to it, a set of instructions meant to achieve contact with one of the gods or spirits depicted in the writings covering it through a service it refers to as Harusco. If these instructions are performed correctly within a period of 30 seconds, SCP-361 will provide a new set of instructions. SCP-361's instructions will grow increasingly convoluted and or nonsensical until becoming almost impossible to perform under the given time limit. Failure to follow an instruction will cause SCP-361 to become inactive for a period of 24 hours. Test Log SCP-361 Test 361A Stage 1 A sheep's liver is introduced to SCP-361. Vocalization Welcome to Harris Co. 
Your sacrifice is very important to us. For Tinia the Thunderer, please perform a horizontal incision on the offering. For Ida of the Underworld, please perform a vertical incision. For Maris, lightly cover your offering with the ash of a dead warrior related to you by blood. Stage 2. A horizontal incision is made. Vocalization. You have selected Tinia. For your weekly meteorological divination, please singe your offering over an open flame for five seconds. For warning bolts, please place a green olive on the altar. For beseechments and beneficial interventions, please attach a written consent from the consulate gods. For catastrophes, please remove the head of an adult ox and hold. Stage 3. The liver is singed over an open flame. Vocalization. You have selected weekly meteorological divination. For your local forecast, please perform the seven sacred rites of Tinia while avoiding the anger of the mildew spirits. For forecasts for other areas, please perform the rites upon a boat of three masts or more. For a marital forecast, please consult with your local priestess of Uni. Stage 4. Researchers were unable to comply with the instructions in the given time frame. Vocalization. No input was received. This sacrifice will be disconnected. Thank you for using Horace Co. Rasna's number one divination and deistic petition service for more than 2,000 years. The gods are looking forward to your next call. SCP-361 enters an active state. Addendum SCP-361-A In order to examine the limits of SCP-361's ability to alter the language and tone it uses to interact with its user, a subject with a similar cultural origin to SCP-361 was required. For that purpose, a request for interaction between SCP-361 and SCP-1510, the persona of which originates from the same general area and time period, was made and accepted. Test 361B Stage 1 Subject D-1510104 Wearing SCP-1510 Introduces a sheep's liver to SCP-361 Vocalization SCP-361 vocalizes in classical Latin, the language spoken by SCP-15101. The instruction is translated to, Son of Romulus, speak the words thy father taught you, and your watcher will speak, his words carried by our spirit. Stage 2 SCP-15101 chants several phrases in Latin, later identified as an oath to Mars Gradivus. Vocalization SCP-361's instruction is translated to Place the aspect of your watcher at his feet, so he might see your altered form. Stage 3 SCP-15101 requests an open flame. He is given a camping gas lamp. SCP-1510 places the lit gas lamp at the feet of the table SCP-361 is placed on. Vocalization SCP-361's instruction is translated to Speak the duty of your watcher, so he might judge your worthiness. Stage 4 SCP-15101 speaks a Latin phrase, later identified as Mars Gradivus' oath, to guard, preserve, and protect the state, the peace, and the senate. Vocalization SCP-361's instruction is translated to Show your watcher that you do not stand alone. Does he who guards your left carry with him your watcher's conviction? Stage 5 SCP-15101 requests one of the supervising researchers to enter the room and touch SCP-361. Request granted. Vocalization SCP-361 speaks in a different voice, still in classical Latin. Courage, Publius. This too shall pass. When Rust claims your soul at last, Valor will make you into Aeneas and carry you beyond these shores to rest among your fathers. The voice was later identified by SCP-15101 as the voice of the Persona's father. SCP-361 enters an active state. Item Number SCP-399 Object Class Safe 
Special Containment Procedures When not being worn by a human being, SCP-399 is inert. SCP-399 is to be kept in a locked safe at facility when not in use. Testing of SCP-399 requires Level 4 approval and is only to be handled by personnel who have received a rating of clear or better on Psychological Profile 399-17. Any generators, power plants, or similar energy sources in the vicinity of testing are to be dedicated exclusively for testing and should not be used to power any other mission essential equipment or facilities. As a result of Experiments 399-4 and 399-5, Testing of SCP-399 on human subjects requires Level 5 approval and is to be conducted in isolation from other SCPs or sensitive facilities. Under no circumstances is SCP-399 to be tested or stored in the vicinity of any free energy or perpetual motion device. Description: SCP-399 is a ring consisting of two metallic bands linked by six metal bars with six pieces of a transparent purple glass between them. The ring is of unknown make and bears no identifying stamps. When not being worn by a human being, SCP-399 is inert. When placed on a human being's finger, the ring activates, which is indicated by the six glass segments beginning to glow one by one. In testing, this process takes from 3 minutes to 6 hours, dependent on the availability of nearby energy sources. Once fully active, the ring responds to spoken or mental commands from its wearer until removed, at which point it becomes inert until worn and re-energized. In this mode, SCP-399 is capable of manipulating or reshaping objects within a 5 meter radius of the wearer, at varying levels of complexity. By a currently unknown mechanism, SCP-399 draws in energy from its nearby environment with which to perform these functions. Minor tasks, such as causing a small object to levitate or turn itself inside out, require minor amounts of ambient energy, which is primarily drawn from the surrounding atmosphere, causing a temperature drop. At finer scales, progressively more energy is necessary and SCP-399 has been known to draw energy from electrical generators, nuclear reactors, and data expunged to complete the reaction. If there is not sufficient energy within SCP-399's range, approximately 300 meters, to perform the operation, SCP-399 will draw on its wearer and data expunged. More detailed operations also carry a greater chance of catastrophic failure resulting in data expunged of the wearer. The extent of SCP-399's ability to alter objects within its range appears to be solely a function of energy available to it. With an adequate power source, manipulation of objects at the atomic or subatomic level appears to be possible. SCP-399 came to the Foundation's attention on data expunged when a string of power outages and unusually cold weather were reported in the vicinity of data expunged. The object was located in the possession of a Mr. who had apparently become deceased during an attempt to use SCP-399 to change lead bars into gold. How he came into possession of the device has not been satisfactorily determined. SCP-399 does not appear to have any means of storing energy that has been drawn in, simply drawing in the quantity it requires to perform a task and expending it immediately. It has been speculated owing to the high energy demands of SCP-399, that it was intended for use in conjunction with a dedicated portable energy source of high volume. Such a device was not found among the effects of In conjunction with such a device or an SCP of a similar nature, SCP-399 could potentially be used to devastating effect, as a weapon of mass destruction, or to neutralize other Keter-class SCPs. Due to the potential negative consequences of a failure on this scale, this line of experimentation is not to be explored at this time. Experiment Log 399 Experiment 399-1 Date Expunged User Dr. Subject One phone book User attempts to open book to page 368 Experiment successful 
Ambient temperature of test chamber drops by 4.8 kelvins. Experiment 399-2. Date. Expunged. User. Doctor. Subject. One t-shirt, colored blue. User attempts to change shirt's color to red. Experiment successful. Power brownouts reported in nearby sections of facility. Ambient temperature of test chamber drops by 9.7 kelvins. Experiment 399-3. Date. Expunged. User. Dr. Subject. One phone book. User attempts to cause text of book to be translated from English to French. Experiment successful. On-site electrical generator overloads and fails, causing loss of primary power to facility for six hours. Ambient temperature of test chamber drops by 17.4 kelvins. Experiment 399-4. Date. Expunged. User. Dr. Subject. One phone book. 3D class personnel. Special test protocols. Experiment 399-4 was conducted in remote facility. All electrical sources in the area were deactivated except those necessary to power monitoring equipment. User attempts to cause text of book to be translated from English to French. Experiment successful. D-class personnel are data expunged. No significant reduction of ambient room temperature. Experiment 399-5. Date. Expunged. User. Dr. Subject. Remains of 1D-class personnel from Experiment 399-4. Special Protocol. Test conducted at remote facility. A dedicated nuclear reactor was provided as energy source. User attempts to restore D-class personnel to his physical condition prior to Experiment 399-4. Nuclear reactor reaches 57% capacity. Subject is successfully reconstructed physically intact, but remains deceased. User attempts to restore subject to life. Data expunged. SCP-399 was recovered by hazmat personnel 48 hours later. Weather patterns in vicinity of facility site normalized within 96 hours. Radiological contamination of the region has been deemed within acceptable limits. Note. Following the loss of Dr. Dr. C requested and was granted permission to conduct the following test on himself. Experiment 399-6. Date. Expunged. User. Dr. C. Subject. Dr. C. User attempts to cause self to levitate. Successful. Upon initial levitation, room temperature begins to drop 1 Kelvin approximately every 0.68 seconds. Dr. C then begins to cause himself to hover slowly about the test chamber, which begins to produce electrical brownouts. The rate of temperature decrease increases to 1 Kelvin per 0.47 seconds at this time, and fluctuates as the rate of the doctor's movement is accelerated or slowed. The experiment is terminated after room temperature drops below 0 degrees centigrade. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.